get in the way. I still know what you did last summer. Get hooked again. Welcome back to the 10th annual Halloween special. Tonight we're talking about a film that, just like the first one, which I reviewed on the 8th annual Halloween special, is one of my guiltiest of guilty pleasures, and that is... I still know what you did last summer. Similar to Jason X, which was my first episode this year, uh, I understand this movie isn't good, and it's not for everybody, and I get that. It's just one of those films that hit me at the right time, and I'm going to talk about that. So the murderous fisherman with a hook is back to once again stalk the two surviving teens, Julie and Ray, who had left him for dead, as well as cause even more murder and mayhem, this time at a posh island resort. The first film isn't exactly a classic of the slasher genre, but it is beloved by some people, mostly from my generation. But I love that movie, and I always will, because it was, for me, what I needed it to be when I first saw it. And even though the sequel is considerably worse than the first movie, this film, as well, hit me at the right time. In the 90s and in the early 2000s, my parents were both bus drivers, and I eventually worked for the same bus depot as well. But occasionally on the weekends, they would get assigned a field trip where they had to take the kids to a football game or band practice or marching band or something like that. Since they would work all evening into the night, they would get paid overtime, so they always took those jobs and they basically were always on Fridays. So occasionally on Friday, my parents would be out of the house and I'm like 12 or 13 years old at this point. And so I would look for whatever was going to be on TV. And on one of those nights, there was some kind of horror marathon going on. I can't remember if it was on TBS, TNT, or USA. One of those networks was showing a bunch of movies. There was one that I'm going to talk about later in this special. I don't want to ruin the surprise. And I still know what you did last summer. It was Friday night. I had the house to myself. I had snacks from the fridge. I had soda. And I had a pan and scan 4x3 version of I Still Know What You Did Last Summer edited for content with commercial interruptions. And I loved every minute of it. Just like the first film, this movie was one of the very first slashers I ever saw. I mentioned in my review for I Know What You Did Last Summer that Psycho was watched when I was too young on TV and I loved it. But I Know What You Did Last Summer, Scream, this movie, and another one I'm going to talk about later in the special, were very impactful for me at that young age. I hadn't yet seen Halloween or A Nightmare on Elm Street. There were so many things I had missed, and I was very young. And so to see a movie like this, it was the perfect gateway into the slasher genre. I recognize, however, that if you're an adult in 1998 and you're watching I Still Know What You Did Last Summer, which was rated R in theaters, you probably thought, this sucks, and there's better stuff out there. You don't have to watch this. But for that kid... It was basically everything in that moment. I felt like I was experiencing something I had never seen before. Over the years, I will watch the movie occasionally every few Halloweens. And of course, there's tons of silly aspects in the movie. There is one absolutely hilarious twist that is now infamous that we'll discuss. There's plenty of questionable performances and story elements that just don't make sense, as well as plot holes. And you can tell that the script was very, very rushed. This movie came out just one year after the first one. So they went into production on this sequel very quickly, and it shows. Something I love, though, about films of this era is that you will occasionally watch one that has huge stars in it, people who are very well known now but weren't yet then. This film has John Hawks in a brief role early on where he gets to sing in a car with Freddie Prince Jr., but more importantly, an uncredited Jack Black. And he is fucking hilarious in this movie. I wish he was around for the whole film. Jeffrey Combs from Reanimator fame also shows up as an asshole desk clerk at the hotel in the Bahamas. The inconsistencies in the plot begin pretty early on when Freddie Prince Jr. is stopped on the side of a road by a car and what appears to be a dead body but turns out to be a mannequin. That's when the fisherman kills off John Hawks and Freddie Prince Jr. is now on the run to try to save Julie who is on a surprise trip to the Bahamas with Mackay Pfeiffer and Brandy and a guy named Will Benson which we'll talk about later on in this video. It's gonna be fun. 
What I want to know is how did the fishermen know that Freddie Prince Jr. was going to be driving on this road with John Hawks? And did he like wait in the bushes and go, oh my God, that's them. Let's park the car this way and get the mannequin situated. Okay, here they come. Oh yeah, cool. They're stopping. All right, now they're gonna go up to the mannequin and now I'm gonna attack. Like, how did this plan <laughs> come to be? Like, did he have to like wait in the bushes and, and hope that somebody would come and it would be Freddie Prince Jr. And now it's time to set up the mannequin? Or did he set up the mannequin and let a lot of people pass by and go, never mind, you're not him, just go, just go. It's, it's a mannequin, don't worry about it, it's fine. This film also does something funny that a lot of 90s movies did where People weren't quite sure what was going on with technology yet. There was this strange period when the internet started to become somewhat popular and known in the world. And all of a sudden you got movies like The Net, where it was just like the internet is a magical place that, that does anything you could ever ask for. And there's nothing that makes sense, but don't worry because it's the internet and it's magic. And in this film, the fisherman apparently hacks the karaoke machine. <laughs> God, I, I really love this movie. <laughs> Realistically, though, there is an argument to be made that Julie just imagined that, but it seems like it really happened. That fisherman, he was back there with the wires like, I got it. I still know what you did. The other thing I love about the movie is that the plot heavily relies on the viewer not knowing what the capital of Brazil is. The radio show that calls Jennifer Love Hewitt and Brandy says, if you know the capital of Brazil, you get a free trip to the Bahamas. And they say Rio. And they're like, you're right, you win. And then later somebody's like, that's not the real capital of Brazil. Rio isn't the capital of Brazil. Sorry, wrong answer, we lose. Something that somehow became famous from the first film was Jennifer Love Hewitt holding her arms out, screaming to the sky. I don't know why, but people love that part. I love that part. <laughs> and in this film, she does it again. I love it. It's like the thing that ties these films together. It's not an I know what you did movie unless somebody screams to the sky like this. So as the fisherman goes around this resort stalking them, we get a few fun scenes, some actually effective chases. But for the most part, it's a lot of popping out of closets and false scares, people behind somebody. There's also a lot of finding of bodies and you don't really necessarily see the kill, which is disappointing. And there's a few really horrendous day for night shots that look very amateur. But the best part of this movie, and I mean that because I fucking love it, is the twist. I mean, it's a big eye roll to be serious, but like, I, I think it's hilarious and I laugh every time. And I showed it to my friend for the first time last night and he looked at me like, are you, is this for real right now? Like they actually did that? And I was like, yeah, they fucking did. And he was like, I have to respect that. <laughs> Tell me why. Why, come on, Jules, think about it. You'll get it. Will Benson. Benson. Hi, Dad. The idea that this guy named himself Benson as a way just to get back at Julie for the fact that they almost killed his dad, whose name is Ben. I just, I love that that ha it almost feels like the writer somehow trolled everybody and somehow got it made. It's just so fucking hilarious. And the film also has a last minute jump scare after Julie shoots Ben like five or six times and he falls into a muddy grave. He's somehow in her house. I, j I don't know. It's that's the dumbest part of the film, to be completely honest, because it was just very obvious that somebody was like, you got to have a final scare. They never made a third movie. So I guess Julie is just dead. I don't know. I don't like that. I wish that wasn't in the movie, to be honest. It just had a happy ending. Fuck it. I don't need to have the fisherman underneath her bed. I'm well aware that this is a desperate attempt by a studio to cash in on a surprisingly successful movie really fast and just kind of rush it out into theaters. But for that 12, 13-year-old kid that I was the first time I saw it, this was one of my gateway slasher movies, and I've always really appreciated it for that. It's also very watchable as a comfort food movie if you can get past a lot of the silly inconsistencies and the hilarious twist. I Still Know What You Did Last Summer is a movie that I will always appreciate for those things, even though I recognize a lot of its silly stuff. What's up? Hey! Oh, it's all good! Guys, thank you so much, as always, for watching. Look forward to more videos in the 10th annual Halloween special coming your way very soon. And if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.